All righty. Uh, so in uh, 6.2, we started, uh, well, in the first half of 6.2, we started uh, talking about um, streams, flowing water. All right. And now we're going to move on to um, lakes and eventually the, the ocean, which um, most folks consider non non flowing and I, and I'm with you I agree the wave wave action certainly is movement but um, compared to a stream it's like uh, you know dead so um, we, we always talk about in geology the sediments are floating in a stream when they uh, enter a, a uh, even the ocean as I said it's essentially like hitting a brick wall okay um, so these are still water for lack of a better word, still water environments. So we're going to start off talking about um, three niche zones. And, and please remember, when we use the word zones, we use the word um, uh, regions or, or biomes. It's all just a whole bunch of words for the same general area. And I, I'm not going to be quizzing you on the, on the gotcha level, OK? Um, I'd like to think my level of, uh, that I hold you guys responsible for stays fairly consistent as we go through this. So again, it's, it's going to be about bigger, um, bigger picture stuff. So you're going to see, you know, littoral, limnetic, and profundal as vocabulary words, as opposed to, um, you know, fussing about what, uh, well, you'll see as we go through. I, if it's not clear, let me know what my concern is. So the littoral zone is essentially the shoreline, okay? And uh, as such, it's, it's shallow waters. Uh, you've all hopefully been to some sort of shore, be it a lake uh, or a uh, marine environment. All right. As such, the sunlight is still able to penetrate through to the uh, ocean floor. There are some parts, of course, if you get deep enough, e even in a lake, um, where you do not have sun going all the way, all the way down. Because you're close to shore, you've got two kinds of vegetation. You've got what we call emergent and submerged. All right. Uh, emergent just means that they start in the water. They might be anchored in the rocks or in the muck, but they grow up and out. Um, can anyone think of a plant that uh, that grows in the water but sticks up and out of the water? There's a really great classic example you probably all know. It's not th necessarily thinking about it. Green with a great big brown stick sticking up in the middle. Fuzzy thing on the end. Yeah, cattails. All right, cattails are a great example of emerging plants. There's, there's many more, but that's a great one. Um, you're only going to see cattails where it's really wet. Not often, you know, not always, you know, in clear water, but definitely murky. Uh, I'm sorry, definitely, you know, so sopping muddy areas there. Um, but uh, so that's an, an emergent plant. It starts in the water, grows up and out. All right. Uh, lily pads might be another one. They're barely emergent, but they are on the surface, especially when they flower. It's probably a better example than cattails because cattails are kind of marshy, but nonetheless. Um, and then submerged plants. Well, that's anything that's just in the water seaweed. proper. Uh, seaweed's a great example. Yeah, kelp. Um, but even um, Looking at some of the the, the scuzzy uh, green stuff that's growing on the the rocks and whatnot, and mind you, some of that's algae, which is technically not a plant, but we're not going to again fuss about that right now. Um, in the littoral zone, in the shoreline environment, you get a wide variety of critters. Um, you've got uh, even a couple levels of food chain going on here. All right, you do have the tiny little things that eat the uh, the plant material, all right, your primary consumers, if you would, to borrow a term from before. Uh, but you also have your, um, your secondary consumers. You've got the, 
things that eat the things that eat the green plants. So while you have your tiny little fishes uh, swimming around, um, you've also got plenty of turtles and frogs there to eat them. Okay. And again, if you've spent any time in the woods, um, fussing around near a lake or anything like that, again, a marsh area, you've seen this kind of environment. You just would never have called it a littoral zone. All right. So this is fresh water, technically speaking. It's all about a lake. But, all right. So, moving from the shoreline outwards, we end up in the limnetic zone. Limnetic zone. Walking out, you're eventually going to get deeper and deeper and deeper, right? Um, eventually, you'll get to a point where you the water is well over your head. Um, sunlight, we used to give, and I might actually give in a couple slides here, give you a number. You know, sunlight can penetrate X number of feet. That really depends on the on the environment, on the water, okay? Um, but what we're telling you here is is in, is that to be in the limnetic zone, the sun does still have to reach to the to the floor, all right? Um, and as such, we're seeing um, the submerged plants still. You're not going to get a whole lot of uh, um, emergence here. Although, again, I think lily pads can be in fairly deep water. It's been a while since I canoed through lily pads, but I seem to recall falling out of a canoe in lily pads and it being rather deep. So um, we're going to see um, phyto and zooplankton. Someone want to remind us the difference between phyto and zoo? Plant and animal, yep. Critters and plants, the plankton, that's the floating food. And because you've got floating food out there, um, you've got a, a different sort of food chain, okay? You've got the little fish that eat them, you've got the medium fish that eat them, and you've got the larger fish. Yeah, they, they, they do that. They do that as well, you're right. Um... So it's not just that the larger fish can't get close to shore because it's so shallow. They also, you know, they want to be where they've got good food. And that's why these, if you remember the first slide we started with, they're, these are called niches, okay? And that niche is your place, your role in the environment. So we wouldn't really have a role for these large fish closer inland. They, they would just have to work too hard to do it. They, they certainly, you know, could if they had to. We talked briefly about living at the outer limits of your tolerances and whatnot. So that's certainly an option, but preference-wise, they're going to be out where there's a whole bunch of medium fish, so they don't have to work as hard. So that was the lim limnetic. Profundal. Profundal. Not all lakes have this zone, all right, because... Lakes, ponds, again, it's all about if sunlight can go all the way down to the bottom. As there is no sunlight in this area, you're not going to get plants, you're not going to get algae. And before I go off on a potential tangent, I want to check the next slide real quick. All right, let's, let's stay with the slides. So what food there is uh, floats down from the top. All right. Um, and then they get decomposed by bacteria. Again, why are there bacteria there? Because there was food for them. All right. There was food, so the bacteria made a go of it. Um, here's the catch, though. Here's the rub. Even though there is a bunch of dead stuff floating down, and if you wanted to, bacteria to eat, um, as part of their life process, the, the bacteria tend to use up the uh, algae, uh, the algae, tend to use up the oxygen, all right? Um, and these are often called uh, dead zones for just that reason. The water is, 
is completely drained of uh, dissolved oxygen. And just a reminder, even though fish, you know, don't sit there and go, <gasps> like we do, um, they, they breathe oxygen. Snails breathe oxygen. Clams, okay, they all need oxygen. So uh, they, just, they just get it differently than we do. Um, so this is, this is a, a, a dead zone, okay, because of the bacteria there. A uh, word you might be familiar with, anoxic, okay, uh, an anoxic environment. And I think I'm giving an example here in a moment. Yeah, turnover. All right. Well, before we get to that, I'm just going to tell you about it here, and then we'll example it in a minute. Um, Green Lake, Syracuse. We've talked about it a couple times, okay? That is so deep. Um, it has this dead zone. It's a very, very deep lake. Um, and uh, as such, there's just you know, parts of that lake out in the center. Actually, I'm told it drops off fair. Has anyone ever uh, scuba there? They used to let people scuba there. It's amazing, I guess. Um, but uh, it, it drops off fairly quickly. But you get out in the middle, it's deep. All right, it's gouged out by the glaciers. Those are glacial lakes. Um, and uh, there was already something there. But when the glaciers came through, they just dug them out even deeper. Uh, Green Lake, there's a couple lakes actually in that, that park area there, but most of you are probably familiar with um, the big round uh, green one <laughs> there where the public beach is and whatnot. But, uh, but that definitely has an anoxic uh, area. And in the next couple slides, we're going to talk about turnover, all right? And um, that's actually really cool. What happens is all those, uh, the water shifts and the nutrients come up from the bottom, um, helps invigorate the top life and uh, keeps everything, for lack of a better word, uh, kind of fresh. Um, as much as a dead zone can be fresh at any rate. So here's a graphic of what we've been talking about. Uh, you got your littoral there. Again, this isn't all referring to lakes, okay? Littoral is the shore. Limnetic is offshore, sunlight penetrating. And then if the lake is deep enough, you'll have that profundal. Okay, as I said, typically out in the middle of it, not always, you know, this is a for educational purposes kind of diagram. And so you have that that low dead zone there where the sunlight just can't make it down any further and stuff just goes to die, rot and be decomposed. And the decomposers use up the oxygen, so that makes it even even worse. Um, I imagine there'd be a bit of a gradation going in there. So if you were a fish swimming about up there, uh, as you approach that profundal zone, you would probably have some concept, you know, some idea that it was fish. Fish aren't great big thinkers, but um, they, uh, you know, they probably would notice, I would hope, that uh, it's getting harder and harder to breathe and turn back. But again, not real high on the processing list as their brains. So turnover ideally happens twice a year. Um, again, this is all sort of textbook stuff. Doesn't apply to every lake all the time. Okay. So um, just like with air, okay, cold, cold water is denser, warm water is lighter. So as the water starts to cool, um, it, it, it sinks. As it sinks, it, it, it uh, pushes the old water out of the way. Um, and, and the lake turns over then. Then we go all winter, okay? And even worse so, you're not mixing with the environment at all, typically because you're iced over, at least in the northern area. So the surface water starts to melt from ice. It reaches its really highest density. This is where the real swap, sw swapping over takes place. All right, is that just melted water, super cold stuff. And it sinks right down, and, and it brings up all kinds of, of nutrients. Which, again, since we're talking about from nature's perspective, that's a great thing. Okay. However, if you've been waiting for Sylvan Beach to open up, and you're all set to go there, and you get this algal bloom. And you get the sign that says you can't swim there yes. because of the algal bloom. Yes, ma'am. All right. That is one 
of the reasons. Uh, unfortunately, surface fertilizers, since we're in environmental science, we'll talk about that. Uh, runoff from the farm fields is another reason. Algae love it just as much as corn does. Um, but uh, you get those algal blooms. And the problem is, is that some of the algae, um, they produce uh, toxins. All right. And then it just makes it, uh, you get sick. You get sick. And it can kill the fish. And that decaying fish isn't a nice thing either. And they just, you know, they end up closing the park for a little while. We see that uh, we don't go to uh, we don't go to that lake, but we do go up to some of uh, the, the beaches along Lake Ontario. And even as big a lake as that is, um, they have problems with with that as well. So always check before you go. You think it's a stinker to to get to Silver Beach and find out it's closed. Try driving all the way up to Lake Ontario and finding out it's closed. The park website will always tell you whether or not. Uh, but they do water quality tests like every two days. So always check. So just a graphic on that. We don't really need to get into details here, but if you were just wondering. And again, this helps with nutrient distribution, helps it not get too horribly murky uh, in general. All right, so we were talking about cattails a couple minutes ago. I may have jumped the gun on that one, but it just—it was the first aquatic plant that came to, to mind. Technically, it's a semi-aquatic plant again because it grows um, in these these wetland areas. Okay, um, we've all heard of wetlands. Um, most people haven't trudged through a marsh or a swamp or a bog. Uh, if you have, you're one of the lucky few. Uh, it is quite an experience. Um, and it's it can be quite dangerous as well because you could fall through, et cetera, et cetera. I don't recommend going out, you know, just randomly exploring. But I was in a class once uh, up on Lake Erie, and we purposely went through a marsh, and it was it was interesting. Um, again, the difference between a marsh and a swamp primarily is vegetation. Swamps are woody. Marshes are more grassy. Okay? I'm uh, not saying that you're not going to see a tree at a marsh, but by far you're going to see much more uh, leafy kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, yeah. And again, there's a tree here or there in the Utica Marsh, but it's it's primarily the green vegetable tation. You might see a shrub, you know, again, here or there. But a swamp, you're going to know, you're going to see those green. And again, Hollywood has done a wonderful job in portraying these for us. Um, if you spend any time on, on 90 and you get up towards, uh, what is it, Hiawatha Preserve out there, uh, if you're going towards uh, Rochester and Buffalo, um, you see those stands of trees that just, you know, they don't look very happy, and they're not. Um, because that wasn't always a wetland uh, in many of those parts. That's one of the examples where it's grown, I think, uh, artificially. But um, so, again, you, humans can, can kind of trick you a little bit uh, by, by flooding an area that used to be a, uh, a woods or a field. Um, but there are certain kinds, and you'll see some pictures in a couple minutes, certain kinds of trees that live quite happily in a swamp. So obviously a difference between a, just a dead stalk of a tree sitting there, no bark left on it. Okay, That's not alive. And that's probably not a swamp. Or at least it wasn't supposed to be a swamp. Uh, back to critters. We talked a little bit about critters with the lake environments. Now we're moving inland, for lack of a better word. Um, and we see totally different, uh, totally different critters. These are where your ducks, your geese are. Uh, but it's not just limited to ducks and geese. You're going to see um, uh, maybe some cranes, some herons. Okay, Large, beautiful birds. Um, beavers, otters, muskrats. Okay. All sorts of furry animals that uh, 
don't mind being wet. These are important, really important areas for, I mean, I've got a handful of reasons here, but the, um, so many more reasons. Um, what we've got here is natural flood control, all right? Um, the wetland, and this just goes back to a, a theme that we've had throughout the semester that, you know, as much as we try and exert our, our, our dominance, Mother Nature is in charge, okay? Um, and we should kind of look and see what, what she di did in the past, what she's trying to do in the present. So if there is a marsh somewhere, that's because for whatever reason or a handful of reasons, there's extra water there. So if you want to build a neighborhood, you probably shouldn't do it there. Because even if you manage to drain that marsh or that swamp or whatever, it's going to fill back up again, or it's certainly going to want to fill back up again, because for the last Lord knows how many years, the earth has been channeling water there. It's a natural low spot. It's a rocks around it aren't uh, permeable enough. Whatever, again, the reason. So you need to look at not just draining it to build, but okay, how are we going to continually route water around this place? So at any rate, short story long, it's, it's natural flood control, okay? When the lakes uh, get filled up, the rivers get filled up, the water's going to go to these, these, these marshes on either side of it. And it's used to it or it, it wouldn't be there, right? Um, groundwater recharge. Again, most of you, many of you probably don't have well water, but a lot of folks do, all right? And um, this is a great place where the earth has an opportunity to refill the groundwater. So yet another reason not to mess with wetlands. Um, also, as, as nasty and as mucky and as dirty as the bottom of a swamp is, um, that actually serves as a cleaner for, um, for the water itself. Oftentimes it'll pick up all of those nasty, um, you know, pollutants that, that we as humans inadvertently throw into the, into the water. Um, one of the best filters you can do for your pools, everybody's got these, these pop-up pools anymore, and you know, we've all gone through the paper filters and this, that, and the other thing. But one of the best filters you could get out there is a sand filter. All right, it's, it's amazing uh, what it will strain out for you. So um, the soil, again, it's, it's a system that's been working for, for millennia. All right, but not just that. I'm guessing I don't have another slide about this. Yeah, I don't have another slide about this. Not just that, um, the, the critters, okay? This is a fairly protective environment to grow up in. Um, you see a lot of larval is not quite the right word, but larval stages, juvenile stages of, of animals that start in these areas and move out into the open waters and so on and so forth. Um, we would not have cranberries. Some of you love them, some of you hate them, but we would not have cranberries were it not for wetlands. Um, you would not have your, your crabs and lobsters and all that were it not for wetlands. So um, inland, you know, we don't tend to fuss with them so much. They might want to throw up a Walmart or something like that. Uh, I think I might have mentioned in Toledo, they drained one to build a Jeep plant. And you'd think Jeep, of all people, would be environmentally conscious, but they weren't. They drained the wetland once to build Yep, in Town, more locally here for you guys. That one they did seemingly well, though, because, again, they left some marsh around it, um, in front of it, and way off to the side, down towards Moe's and Olive Garden. There's a whole bunch of wetlands back there. Um, before they did the mall, I think the golf course has been there even longer. That was wetland, I'm told. Um, so all that water went somewhere. and Maybe that's why the sequoia's been having the problems it has. Who knows? But, um, but in, internally, we tend not to mess with them. But boy, the coastal ones, because that's property value, baby. That's, that's, that's rich stuff there. 
So those are the ones that they like to go in and, and, and mess with. And, and more and more lately they've been, lately, the last couple decades, been doing a lot more to protect them uh, from development. Estuaries. We mentioned estuaries the other day in passing. Pretty sure. Um, estuaries, <clears throat> think of a bay. Okay. Um, the stream comes down, empties into an open body of water. And what we have in an estuary is a, a mixing of, of fresh water coming in from the, the continents, from the land, to the ocean. And as such, uh, we've got a really unique um, water chemistry going on, which lends itself to, um, again, a lot of unique habitats. If it weren't for estuary and environments, the salmon, you know, talk about a unique evolutionary adaptment, um, adaptation. You know, the, the salmon are able to gradually uh, adjust their tolerance for salinity as they move uh, through the, the estuary environments and, and decrease salinization to get up into um, the, the, the St. Lawrence there, up, up where Thousand Islands are, and come down into these streams. Okay? And then go back and and live in a saline environment again. That's really unique. Okay, um, there there's some other examples of critters that just stay there. And then we've all heard about those sharks, you know, wandering inland a little bit. Um, other critters are certainly capable of doing it, but um, but the salmon's a great example of it. But again, it's it's a it's a wonderful environment for. Uh, Many of the foods you you love to eat. I talked about this essentially. Excuse me a second. I have to. All right, so a couple minutes ago, I uh, asked you to imagine a bay when we talked about estuaries, right? Uh, and I kept it pretty aquatic in, in that example. Um, but of course, there are uh, shorelines around the bays as well, not just one. Um, two unique environments uh, that we've got there are uh, salt marshes and mangrove forests. Um, I mentioned a couple of minutes ago about certain trees that are quite happy growing in water. Um, mangroves are, are one of them, for sure. Um, salt marsh, as we told you a couple of minutes ago, marshes are grassy. Uh, so these are really special um, grasses. And I think I even talked about, um, did I talk about the Chincoteague ponies in here? Little pot-bellied ponies down in Virginia. It all blends together. All right, well, we're going to talk about them now, then. Uh, if they have a variety that... Um, excuse you. Cattails are usually freshwater, but there certainly could be a, a saltwater variety of them. Um, so we'll talk about salt marshes in a minute. Mangroves, um, again, you've seen them. In, uh, in probably in Hollywood, unless you've been lucky enough to get way down south uh, or to a few islands. Uh, when you see the pictures, you'll, you'll recognize the trees, so almost, almost guarantee it. All right, so this is Chincoteague, um, one of the places I've been lucky enough to spend a little time. This is obviously uh, kind of inland here, but we're looking out uh, to the uh, green area in the middle of the water. And you might look at that and say, well, it looks like an island. Uh, at the moment, it is an island, but when the tide goes out, it's a whole bunch of muck. That area happens to be slightly higher than the surrounding area, which is why it's islanding, islanding, if I could conjugate as such, islanding itself. Um, but uh, believe me, the water that that grass is getting watered with is salty, okay? Um, brackish is the word we used a while back, and... Um, if you were to eat that grass, if you were a grass-eating critter, you would definitely be getting more than your daily requirement of salt. Um, so we have special organisms, again, that are adept to uh, eating that. 
and there happens to be a little group of uh, ponies that was abandoned there long, 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 long time ago who uh, were able to deal with that. And again, since they stayed and they bred, uh, they passed that tolerance on. Um, and uh, they've got quite a, quite a population, so much so that the, the local volunteer fire department every uh, summer, I think it's, it's right uh, early summer, um, they have a huge uh, festival where they sell off, you know, dozen, two dozen of the horses. So they definitely have a sustainable population there. Um, but the funny thing is, as I said, is, you know, we've all heard if you, you eat too much salt, you're going to retain water. And these guys have these, these great big old pot bellies um, from, from retaining that water. So, um, but anywhere, again, if you've been lucky enough to get to the shoreline, You've seen these areas where when the tide's in, um, there's just little bits sticking out here and there. The tide goes out, you see all the, the oyster beds and whatnot and the, the high spots where the grass is. I've got a, a gajillion pictures of them. I thought I had more in here than just one because I certainly have better pictures. But I think I was looking at the, the green sticking out of the blue there. So here's the mangroves. I told you they'd be fairly recognizable. Usually, they, you see them in the background when somebody, they're doing a fan boat chase or whatever, you know, down in the bayou or something like that. Um, they're not dead. Obviously, you see the leaves up top there, and you're like, well, what's with all the roots sticking out? Well, that's in the, in the tide line. Okay, it's in the tide zone. So there's not going to be soil there. Uh, they're rooted down much deeper. Okay. And as you, again, as you can see, they're quite happy. They're not dead. So it's a mangrove, it's a special type of, of tree. All right, so we talked about freshwater as streams. We talked about freshwater as lakes. We talked about the area leading out to marine as the um, estuary environments. And now we're moving out deeper Okay, we're moving out into uh, a straight-on marine environment. You may not have known numbers, but you certainly could have guessed that uh, the oceans are much deeper than lakes, right? Um, and as such, the sunlight is definitely not reaching the bottom of the majority of the ocean by any means. There is still a zone that we'll talk about that gets sunlight, but we have a much bigger area that does not. Additionally, with few lakes aside, there's a current if you would. We have waves. I mentioned Lake Ontario. I don't know how much you guys get up there or to any of the other Great Lakes. They are large enough to have waves. They're wind created, but they do have wave action. Even some of your smaller lakes can get on certain days waves, but on a continual basis you'll get waves. Tides, no, you don't see those inland, okay? Um, the tides are caused by the moon pulling on the ocean. Sounds kind of crazy, but that's how it works. And um, tide goes in, tide goes out. Again, if you spend any time at the shore, you're probably familiar with, with the effects. And also there's currents. Again, not just way out but also close to shore. Has anyone had the unfortunate um, reason to know about rip currents, riptide? I did. Ocean almost killed me. Um, a rip current is a current that uh, basically is kind of a jet stream straight out. And uh, I was on my bodyboard years ago 
with a bunch of other people. And next thing I knew, I was a good 50 yards further out than they were. And uh, bigger waves, so on and so forth. And I wasn't riding one of those in. Um, in fact, it knocked me off of one. So um, currents aren't just big. You know, you hear about coming down from the north into the south and, and so on and so forth. And you might have heard about the horse latitudes and, and all that stuff in some of your geography and your history classes. But there's also currents near shore. There's longshore current, which goes on the east coast. It goes southwards. To, well, it goes on the west coast. It goes southwards as well. But um, it carries sand southwards along the coast. Um, lots of different things. The point is, is that there's a lot more... Um, variables when we're talking about these kinds of environments as opposed to the freshwater environments. So now, remember I told you how we'd have this different words for the same kinds of things? Here we are. Before we had littoral, what, and profundal. I forget the middle one actually at the moment. Limnetic, thank you. Littoral, limnetic, and profundal. Now we've got intertidal, pelagic, and benthic. They're going to end up being essentially the same thing, but we use these words when we're talking about marine environments. You follow? You'll see them each again, so... And unfortunately, I know this isn't very large for you guys to see back there, but there's about 24 other vocabulary words. We're not going to touch on anywhere near all of them, so don't worry. But it gets quite, quite complicated. So again, let's at least start by keeping it simple. The same three environments that we had before, same three niches that we had before, except now we're at the marine. So we have intertidal, pelagic, and benthic. Okay, intertidal, pelagic, and benthic. A minute for those of you that are taking notes, good. So, <coughs> Excuse me, the intertidal is along the shoreline. This is life within the tides. I mentioned this before, I don't remember the context, but this is a very, very high energy zone. You're not going to have a whole lot of critters like trying to make a living right here. Uh, and only two really come to mind. Okay, if you're in an actual beach, a sandy beach environment, you've got the clams that live in the sand, and you've got the little pipers running back and forth trying to eat the, the clams before they get uh, rebury themselves. And anything else that washes up. Now that's in a sandy beach. That's probably where you've been, if you've been. Now, if you left the hotel beach and went to a state park north or south of there, you might actually encounter the other kind of beach where there's rocks. And this provides an entirely different kind of living environment because there's hiding places. There's rocks to attach to. And as such, you get entirely different critters. This is where you're going to see your starfish, your urchins, your all those kind of things. Because they've got these little, you know, ponds even that can stay full when the tide goes out. These little tidal pools. You've heard of tidal pools. Here's a great picture. I think I grabbed this from your textbook. So those starfish are just going to cope until the tide comes back in. But they could seal themselves off well enough until that time. You've got your 
we'll call it seaweed. It's not really seaweed back here. And that's got a variety of little critters on it. And all these guys are hardy enough, again, or they wouldn't be there uh, to make a go of it. Now, most people, as I said, don't want to go step on this stuff, let alone look at it or smell it. So this is why the majority of your, your, your beaches that you see are the sands, okay? Um, this is no less, uh, and, and not that the sands are unnatural. There's plenty of areas where they are natural sand beaches. They just, you know, have to keep it, filling it with, with sand because of that longshore drift that I mentioned. It steals your sand every moment of every day. It's constantly washing the sand away, so they, the hotels and whatnot have to replenish it. Um, but this is definitely a much more natural environment because they, there's really, you know, short of picking up cans and bottles and wrappers that idiots leave behind, um, there's, there's, it's all that you don't have to do anything to this environment. And these, as I said, tend to be more like your state parks and whatnot, and national shoreline. So we're familiar with that. And um, this is where it kind of gets confusing. Because depending on the time of day, you could be standing in, I'm going the wrong way here. You could be standing in the intertidal zone and be up to your knees, practically your waist, whatever thinking that you're in the ocean, so to speak, the pelagic zone, all right? So when I have you guys picture stuff in your head, even though it's what it says here is true, okay, all the water from the shoreline to the, to the deepest, blah, 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 go out to where you can't stand, that's, that's pelagic, okay? That's where it kicks in, where you're likely to get bitten by a shark, where da 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 da, -da. You, you know, it's the water's over your head, so on and so forth. That's that open water. Now, as I showed you in that diagram, the pelagic is going to get subdivided like they didn't have anything else to do with their time. And then they didn't, they're oceanographers, right? That's, that's all they do is study the ocean. So, we're going to try, as I said, I picked a handful of things to narrow it down a little bit. We've got the neuritic zone. So, the neuritic zone, if you follow here, is within the pelagic. This is open waters, but close to shore. This is where I was just telling you to stand where it's over your head. All right, and this is all the way up to, well, it starts there for the most part. So the neuritic, near, near shore, neuritic. The oceanic, the open ocean. That's where you're out there with you know, the larger boats, um, you're definitely not standing, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Another zone. This euphotic zone is within the neuritic and the oceanic because of its definition. Excuse me, I'm going to sneeze. <sighs> Thank you, guys. Euphotic simply refers to the fact that sun is shining through it. Okay? So the sun is definitely shining through and reaching the bottom of the neuritic. And that can also be true as you go out into the oceanic. You could be out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, mile and a half deep, but there is a part of that where the sun shines down, okay? And uh, again, I told you there would be a number at some point, 488 feet. Well, that's awfully damn specific. I'm sorry. Um, that's going to be an average. 
Uh, I could tell you there's some areas near shore where the water, the sunlight isn't going more than a foot because it's so dang murky. But generally speaking, out in the open ocean where you do have, believe it or not, less murk, less everything like that, the sun can actually go down fairly far. It's surprising, actually. So almost 500 feet. That's your active zone for life. That's where your plankton are. That's where your fish are going to come up to feed if they don't already live there. So that's the euphotic. Remember, photic is light. And that spans. And that's why, as much as I tell you, don't worry about that picture, it is worth staring at it in your textbook for a couple minutes to try and suture this all together. So the euphotic spans the neuritic and the oceanic. All right, I started to say a couple minutes ago where the oceanic kicked in, and I stopped myself, hoping there was a slide coming up. Because, again, this goes out a lot farther than, I don't say even I would think, but, yeah, even, that even I would think. Um, basically, you got to get out past the continental shelf. All right? Any clue what the continental shelf is? Yeah, you've heard of it. It's, you know, basically where the continent ends. Um, when you're standing on the ocean floor, let me rephrase that. When you're at the beach and you're standing in the water at the beach, you're still on continent. You go out where it's over your head, you're still on continent. You go out miles and miles further out, you're still on continent. At some point, not today I don't think, we're going to talk about continental shelf, continental rise, abyssal plains. Remember all those words? You heard them in maybe geography or something years ago. Right now, it's not out 100, 650 feet. We're talking about the water depth. And again, this is an approximate. Not every continent is arranged the same dang way. This is a generalization. And again, this is where the majority of your fishing, etc., is going to be taking place. This is where the majority of your critters are. This keeps you well within the photic zone. What do we have the photic zone here a minute ago? 488 feet, right? So you're going all the way out. You've got, for all but the last 100 or so feet, you're in the photic zone. Plenty of abundance for life. We see planktonic and nectonic again. Those haven't changed. Plankton are still your floaters. Nectar are still your swimmers. And those are niches. Those are food chain levels. This, as we said earlier, this is by far the majority of the ocean. Okay? Last bullet is the one that says it all. Essentially everything that's not over the continental shelves. When you look big picture, the continental shelves matter. In the last class I was in earlier today, we were talking about, somebody asked me, I mentioned glaciers, and he had heard something on Joe Rogan about what caused the glaciers to retreat or to come down, and I said, well, first of all, not your best source for science news, but um, we started talking about how sea level used to be a lot lower when the glaciers were on um, the continents. All right, all of not all a lot of that continental shelf was exposed back then. All right, there are certainly times in history when we've lived on the continental shelves, when organisms have lived on the continental terrestrial organisms 
have lived on the continental shelves. Um, you look at these submerged, the Mediterranean is a great place where they love to show you on the, on the Nature Channel and whatnot, all of these uh, sunken islands and cities and so on and so forth. They didn't sink. Water level just rose when the glaciers melted. All right, They didn't build them underwater in the first place or any of that. There's no Aquaman and mermaids, unfortunately. All right, That stuff was dry land. That was continental shelf that was exposed. So, um, you know, when we're, when we're talking about beyond that, okay, there's a drop-off. And uh, that's when we enter the full, full ocean area. Um, more or less unaffected with the glaciations and whatnots. Again, this is what deep sea is. Now, again, when somebody says they went deep sea fishing, did they technically go out past the continental shelf? I have no idea. Never been. Anybody gone deep sea fishing? No? All right. So, again, that might be a misnomer, like granite countertops. Very few of those things you buy are actually granite. There's other kinds of igneous rocks, but nobody wants to buy an igneous rock countertop. They all want granite. But if an igneous rock countertop just doesn't belong to the Right, that's, planet. yeah, it's, it's marketing, right? But, and I was, I was very naive about it. We went to, to buy countertops for, actually, the house we just sold. Uh, a good 10 years ago, and we went to get our pick out our own granite because we're geologists. That's what we do, right? So I'm asking the kid. It was amazing, beautiful pieces. Of, you go to Syracuse and look at these things. It's just huge pieces of polished stone. I know you guys are mostly too young to buy a house, but you'll be there one of these days. Um, maybe not even a quarter of the stuff in that place was granite. Um, it was diorite. It was basalt. It was a whole bunch of names that don't mean anything to you guys, but... They sure as hell weren't granite. So, where deep sea fishing takes place, who knows? So, like the person might not even notice there's probably not even a whole lot of it is actual diamonds. None of it is diamonds, yes. They're very pretty quartz crystals. Yeah, Herkimer diamonds are, um, for the most part, double ended, uh, double pointed quartz crystals. So, they're very pretty and they're very cool for, for what they are. Um, but yeah, definitely not, uh, definitely not diamonds. For one thing, diamonds are carbon, and they, these are silicon. But very cool stuff, very cool stuff. All right, lest we digress. Um, so this is the deep sea, okay? Um, and again, the oceans are quite deep, two miles. Uh, many of you drove over two miles today, all right, uh, to come to class. But if you go up two miles, you go down two miles, things change dramatically. All right, so what we think of moving around the surface horizontally is, is, is easy peasy, nothing. Uh, two miles down into the ocean, things change very dramatically, very quickly. Okay, um, quite different. The, the, the pressure, for one thing, is, is unbearable. Um, these submarines and, and whatnot, these deep sea vessels we go in, they are highly pressurized. Uh, dive suits, not that we put people down that far, but these dive suits, again, are pressurized. Um, it's very cold down there, all right, and um, obviously lack of sunlight, yet another issue. So before we talked about dead material floating down and getting eaten by the Bacteria, remember that, in the lakes? Well, now when we're in the um, saltwater realm, we're going to give it a, wor a vocabulary word. They're calling it marine snow. And this is how life out in the deep oceans um, builds their food chain. This de dead, decaying organic material that, that floats down from the, uh, from the photic zone, I'm sorry, the euphotic zone. Um, and it drifts down there, and organisms eat that. Detritivores, if you would, to borrow from one of our early chapters. Decomposers. And that builds a food chain. Then we get, you know, the filter feeders, the scavengers, the predators on top of all of that. So we have a whole other ecosystem down there based on this marine snow. And lastly, we hit the ocean floor. 
Yeah, it's the same ocean floor that you started off standing on at the beach six slides ago. But it's changed. It's gone off. It's left the continent. And as it's left the continent, it drops off a great big cliff. And it actually changes rock type. The ocean floors are made out of different material than uh, out in the open than they are close to shoreline. They've got a lot less sediment on them as well. But we just want to remind you that, technically speaking, the ocean floor does start, you know, at the shoreline, even though it's technically continent still there. Benthos, that's the bottom dwellers. Okay, we had the benthos before. We talked about the fact that they could crawl, they could burrow, they could attach themselves to rocks, remember that? So the same idea, just a different environment. So as such, we have the neuritic benthos, and we have the oceanic benthos, so the near shore and the deep ocean. And we're going to stop. Let me make sure before I say that. Yeah, we're going to stop here because I'm not going to get through. Well, okay, this isn't the slide. Yeah, we're going to we're going to actually finish. I apologize. Got y'all excited there. Um. Well, what time do we go till? Thirty-five. I could do this in, stop putting your stuff away. No, I can't do this in 10 minutes. This is talk about stuff, so. All right, we're going to let her go.